I said that there were no new words in the literature of the word. I just realized I misspoke. What I meant was in the portion of the literature of the word that are around the scriptures, there are no new words. But there are new words in the liturgy of the word, and specifically, it's the creed. And I love this. Two things that I want to say about the creed from two liturgists. One, the creed, quote, is the scripture reduced to one page. Isn't that great? The other, quote, it is not a loyalty oath. It is a statement of praise, more oriented to glorifying God than providing information. In this sense, the creed is more like a hymn than anything else, and hymns ought to be sung. So it's not a loyalty oath. It's all of scripture reduced to one page. We will pray new words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Do you see this? Yes? Now it's unseen, but it's not invisible. There's a difference between things that are visible and invisible and things that are seen and unseen. We believe that there are invisible realities, for example, angels, saints. We will say, I believe. The original Greek is we believe. In Latin, it is credo. And why did it, there was this shift from we believe at the Council of Nicaea to credo, I think it was a matter of the church believes, and in the context of the church believing, again, a person individually, personally, appropriates the faith for him or herself. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, we talked about that earlier, born of the Father before all ages. That's new. Because right now in the creed, if you didn't know better, and we know better, you would think that Christ was not born until Mary. That's what we now say. But actually, Christ was born of the Father before all ages. That is to say, begotten of God. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. We now say one in being with the Father. There are all sorts of people who say, oh, consubstantial is a very hard word to say. Nobody says it. Uh, why can't we say one in being? It means the same thing. It does. So why say consubstantial? It's in Latin. But I think there's a more important reason. The deeper meaning. This is a term that nowhere else is used in the world. Nobody else on the planet Earth talks about God being consubstantial. It's a word that the fathers of the church, the bishops of the church in the earliest times hammered out trying to talk about how is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what, how can we talk about one God, three persons? And we say because there's this substance, and not substance as we mean it physically, but there is this stuffness, there's this beingness. And the word that they came up with was consubstantial. And perhaps in continuity with Christians since the beginning of Christianity, we will continue to say that word. I think that's a, a good thing. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit. That's a difference. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who incarnates, so was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. So Jesus is born before all ages, becomes flesh by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death. That's the Latin term, death. So there, there's something about experiencing death. He, he suffered it. 
rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Right now we say in fulfillment of the scriptures. Well, actually, in accordance with the scriptures is far more correct. In fulfillment of the scriptures makes it seem like this had to be done, whereas in accordance is it's simply we're simply recording what the scriptures say. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Who? Why? Because God the Father is often identified in the masculine. Christ Jesus, obviously, because he was a male, is identified in the masculine. The Holy Spirit is that person of the Holy Trinity that is not ascribed theologically any gender. And so we don't ascribe gender to the Holy Spirit. We just say who, which is, I think that's, that's a much deeper meaning, a much better thing. It keeps us from being too terribly sexist. <laughs> I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism. I confess it. I own it. For the forgiveness of sins. And this is my favorite change. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Right now, we look to the resurrection. We will look forward to the resurrection of the dead. I love that. I will look forward to one day being in a resurrected body in heaven. I look forward to that. One of the things that we say is when we, there will come a time, Mary is in heaven in her body, Christ Jesus is in heaven in his body. We don't know what their resurrected bodies look like. I tell people all the time, years ago, I was at a mall and I saw my body in the resurrection. And it was lovely. I said, that's my body in the resurrection. None of, you will none of you will know me until I open my mouth and say hi. You say, wow, you are looking really resurrected. And I want you to know, I look forward to that. <laughs> Nothing new about the prayer of the faithful, but it's just, it's a good thing to remember what the prayer of the faithful is about. The prayer of the faithful reminds us we have heard God's word. We experience what God is doing in our midst. And because we experience what God is doing, we pray that God will do that for others. Intercessions lead us beyond ourselves. Petitions are prayers that we pray for ourselves, dear God. Oh, give me a parking space. <laughs> a Ferrari to go in the parking space. <laughs> That's a petition. When we pray for our sisters and brothers throughout the continent of Africa who are dying of AIDS, babies whose bellies are bloated, we are moved beyond ourselves. And we're asking God to do something for others. That's what the deeper meaning is. In the liturgy of the Eucharist, perhaps the place where we will see most changes uh, is in the Eucharistic prayer. In the Holy, we now say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of power and might. We will now then sing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of hosts. Sabaoth is not simply about God's power and might. Sabaoth is mighty armies hosts of heaven. So, I think it's a deeper meaning. I think that's a good meaning. This is what we will hear during the consecration. Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which is given up for you. New words. Right now we say, take this, all of you, eat it. Now we say, eat of it. And that's really important. 
because the idea is there's one loaf, even though it doesn't, we see it as many hosts, there's one loaf of which we eat, we eat of it, we eat of the one Christ. Eat of this, why do we eat of this? For, because this is my body, which is given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. We now say cup. Chalice is a more formal word. It's a ritual word. It points to, this is not simply any cup, but a ritual cup. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For, why do you drink from it? For, because this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. Everlasting is time-bound. Eternal is beyond time. Isn't that a clever switch? Yes. Which will be poured out for you. Why poured out from shed? Because Christ's blood is poured out and the chalice is poured out. For you and for the many, this causes huge controversy. Why not for all? Did Jesus die just for many? The church is unambiguous about this. Jesus Christ died for all. The Aramaic expression that Jesus used was for the many. It came over into the Latin Pro multis, for the many. Uh, in French and Spanish, I think in German, I'm not sure, they still say for, pour la multitude, in French. Now, this leads me to an important thing. Emily Bessel, many years ago, she's a woman theologian, liturgical theologian in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. She said one of the, my most favorite lines. She said, just because the liturgy is in our language does not mean we understand the language of the liturgy. Just because it's in our language doesn't mean that we understand the language. Here's a perfect example. We hear in English for the many and we think it might be exclusive. It is not. Just because it's in our language doesn't mean that we understand the language. When the church says, for the many, the church is making a deep theological proclamation here. Christ died for all. One of the subtle nuances, one of the subtle things about using for the many is we have free will to cooperate with what God in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit did. For the forgiveness of sins, not, that so, not so that sins may be forgiven, but for the forgiveness, they are forgiven. They are forgiven. Love that change. Do this in memory of me. Then the priest will say, the mystery of faith. Why? Because we don't say, this is the word of the Lord. We don't say, this is the gospel of the Lord. We don't say, this is the body of Christ. We say, the word of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord, the body of Christ. And now we will say, the mystery of faith. And you will sing, and I love this. You will sing, and I'll, every priest will stand there and hear you sing. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Save us, Savior of the world, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. They are acclamations. Right now, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, are declarative sentences. And they're not acclamations. And so now we will acclaim Christ by speaking directly to Christ and what Christ is doing. There's a deeper meaning here. The deeper meaning is we acclaim, we, we, yeah! Did you get that? Yeah! 